The things of your past withholds you your future. God shared with me that although I chose to be with my husband, who he was as an individual was meant to accentuate who I was. This is, after all, what a relationship of any kind is supposed to do. A relationship is to enhance and accentuate the positive qualities in each other. But for me, my husband accentuated all the negative qualities that were deep within me. I couldn't recognize this at the time, of course. I always questioned, why does he keep hurting me? I do not doubt that you have said this about your significant other. We expect our loved ones to accentuate the positives in us, but no. The negativity that is drawn out from us is in conflict with them. That is meant to help us change. But again, we must see that we have to change. It isn't that complicated. And no, your significant other is not snickering every time you are emotionally distraught. They are agitated too in their own way. You can't see how they are negatively affected because self-pity only allows you to see the situation from your perspective, respectively. It is true. We always hurt those we love, and that is because we are all approaching love, true unconditional love, from the wrong perspective. We are trying to attain unconditional love from the other person while not knowing how to give it to ourselves. We reap what we sow, and if we are sowing into this world love that has conditions, this is what will come back to us. We can't help but notice because the unconditional love we receive calls out the hidden emotions of our subconscious reactions in our youth. We became who we are because of our responses to conditional love. This is what other people draw out in us. While we assume we are responding to their behavior in real time, the truth is we are responding to what we have already experienced. What they show us is unknowingly familiar and we respond to this, not realizing we are still responding to the pains of our past. Once I realized that my husband's narcissistic tendencies, and yes, there were many, was a means for God to get my attention. I began working on healing myself from narcissism and taking a deep consideration into my childhood. My memories were fragmented, and I have always been okay with that. Some things I believe are hidden from us to protect us. We don't need to know everything, but the memories I was aware of, I began to ask God about. He was there watching over me before my life began, and so I began to trust him with these answers. The answers were painful, but God never delivered them in a way that I could not bear, and he didn't deliver them before I was ready to hear them. Addressing the issues within me helped me to see my situation for what it really was. It was meant to help me, not hinder me. I was allowing the situations in my marriage to hinder me, and that was the reason why my personal achievement, excuse me, that is why My personal achievements never went anywhere. Things I did always fell flat. With my foot rooted in the past, I was using the other foot to take baby steps towards healing with God, which I did, but at some point that progression stops because one cannot move without taking the hind foot out of place and moving it forward. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Matthew chapter 10 verses 37 through 39. I remember when God spoke this scripture to my heart. I was mowing the lawn, contemplating why it seemed like my birth mother hated me so. God shared with me that she was jealous because I won the affections of her father, my grandfather. When I was born, I became the apple of his eye and no longer did my mother feel like she was her daddy's little girl. He was an anchor point in my life. 
Through my grandfather, I knew what love was like. As the, memory I was ha as the memories I have of him are nurturing. But when he died, when I was 16, it was an actual shock to my system and I lost myself for a time. I thought that when he went away, the love that I had in me, as little as it was, went away too. Now the memories of my mom are scarce and extremely negative. Now I don't fault my mom. I've forgiven her a long time ago. She had issues of her own to work out. But the fact is she was trying to take care of me through the perspective of resentment and jealousy that alcoholism accentuated. I do not know the history into what caused her to depend on alcohol. That's not my burden. I got rid of that weight long ago, but when God told me the truth about why my mom was always so distant and emotionally vacant with me, I understood. And it gave me a sense of peace to truly understand that my existence was not rooted in what she thought of me. My existence mattered because I am a creation of God's. What was going on with my mom all these years was never my fault, even though she took it out on me. But it reminded me of my husband's cheating ways. These were never my fault. And psychologists can say all day long, it takes two to make or break a relationship. Yes, that's true. But infidelity and cheating is a choice. And nobody forces you to make a choice. You choose what you want to choose in anything. It was my husband's choice to make to find love through another. If he had an issue with me, it was his responsibility to open the lines of communication and talk and share with me, to which he never did. He avoided his own issues and made decisions that had nothing to do with me. No one deserves to be cheated on. No one. And no one deserves to be hurt. And no one deserves to be and feel unloved. I considered myself a good wife, a, a good person. I mean, I'm not perfect. I did my best, and I could have improved, certainly. But at some point, I had to stop owning his decisions. Every time I gave in to the narcissistic supply, every time I responded with a knee-jerk reaction, I was allowing the negative situation to devalue me because I have always felt devalued. My theta wave imprinting was deeply supplanted with all things negative, that in my responses, I took upon myself to shoulder the blame. My mother's actions towards me showed me I was not good enough. And this is what I learned. And this is what I learned that became a subliminal belief or a self-limiting belief. Through my responses of other people's vulnerabilities that exposed hidden truths in me, I was further reiterating to myself that I didn't matter. That I didn't, if I didn't have, if I didn't matter, I didn't have a voice. And if I didn't have a voice, I wasn't worth any value. Now, people do not treat us the way that we want to be treated. No, instead, people treat us the way that we treat ourselves. And the way that we allow others to treat us. Our theta wave imprinting reveals to ourselves and to others our character. And although we are responsible for the choices we make now, those choices we made as children are what cause us to make choices in the here and now. So it's a catch-22. We're darned if we do, we're darned if we don't. 
Something's got to give. And it's not the outside that has to give. The outside gives to us already. The outside world cannot give to us anything more than what we are willing to receive or sow into this world. What we sow into this world, what we sow into ourselves, the world gives back to us. And so something has to give. We have to start asking questions ourselves, the needed questions of why are we doing what we do? What are we actually doing? Is this effective? We need to start taking a look inwardly. We can't just ignore the problem and expect the problem to go away. That's not how God's kingdom works. We cannot fully love God fully and completely if we are not willing to fully and completely love ourselves. And we cannot fully and completely love ourselves when we have been negatively loved from our past. Our past catches up with us and will follow us through till the end. God showed me that because I was hanging on to the past pains and seeking my mother's validation through finding validation in someone who also rejected me, I was actually trying to right their wrongs and right the wrongs of the past. And this I could never achieve because I was hanging on unknowingly, of course. So I could not lend myself to forgiveness. And I could not forgive them, and I could not forgive myself, and I couldn't do either. Then I couldn't accept God's forgiveness of me. Because forgiveness means letting go and letting God. And there is a reason why. Okay, history record does not record itself. There is no record of history aside from the historical books and whatnot. But when you look at yourself, there is no, by nature, there is no book that says Janice did such and such on this day and she saved the world on that day and she conquered lions on this day. There is no record of your personal history. And that is why there is no memory. There is no conscious memory of how you developed as a child. God does not want us to be rooted in the past. The past is gone. And we keep record of it by hanging on to it, by allowing it to further dictate to who we are, and we stop ourselves from the blessings of the present and the future. Because the past has said, no, you're not worthy. And that's kind of strange because the past our decision making processes of our past were when we were children when we were immature when we were naive and ignorant to the realities of life and now that we know the realities of the life it's like we are still our inner child is dictating to us and telling us and directing us as adults would you take direction from a child? Would you give the keys to your vehicle to a child? So why are we allowing our inner children to dictate to us decisions that we as adults should be making? And it all goes back to rejection. Feeling invalidated. And this is where we need to start allowing God to nurture us 
nurture that inner child, allow God to allow us our inner child to accept the love of God and allow our adult beings self-parent the inner child. When we learn to forgive, when we forgive ourselves, we learn to forgive others. You need to learn to forgive that, okay, you made choices in your past. Maybe you were sexually molested. Maybe you were neglected. Maybe you um, were abused in some sort of way. Maybe you had some sort of trauma that... Um, I don't know, hurt your physical body in some way. Maybe there was emotional pain from your parents or your siblings that you have not yet gotten over. And you as an adult now who is mature, you need to stop ignoring that inner child who demands a voice and say, okay, I hear you. I understand what you went through. I understand your position. And now let's put some boundaries in place. Let's begin healing with God. I accept that you went through this. And that's what I had to do. I had to take a look at myself and say, I accept that I went through that. I accept that I was neglected by my mom. I accept that I was rejected. I accept that I was sexually molested. I accept that I was abandoned by my father. I accept that I wasn't loved. And I accept the love of Jesus. I don't, I admit I don't fully understand it, but I accept it. And when you learn to accept yourself, you learn to forgive. You learn to forgive others and say, I forgive my parents. They did the best that they could. They were hurting themselves. And they were parenting me from the ways that their parents parented them. And based on their social upbringing and social standing and whatever, the social norms. I accept it. It doesn't, and accepting it doesn't make it right. Accepting something and forgiving it does not mean that you are saying, okay, it was right for you to do. That's not what that is saying. And sometimes we fail to forgive because we misunderstand that forgiveness sometimes means acceptance, but it doesn't mean that we say it was okay and it was right it was wrong all trauma all neglect all unconditional love is or excuse me all conditional love is wrong but in forgiveness means to let it go and move on so you can be the best that you can be for God, for yourself, for your family. The pains of the past reveal where our unforgiveness rests. For me, having one foot planted in the past meant that I was unwilling to forgive it. I was holding on to it, and therefore I could not cling to my future, who was Jesus. With me hanging on to the people of the past, I was setting myself up for failure stagnancy and ruin. I cannot let go of my parents. I was trying to seek their validation. And Jesus says, anybody who cannot leave my, their parents for me is not worthy of me. And when we hang on to the people of the past and the pains of the past, we set ourselves up for ruin. And this is what we unknowingly do to ourselves. We keep the cycle of abuse going through negativity. And negativity is opposite of who God is, as he is love. In love, there is life-giving principles. God says that if he, we follow him, he will give us a long life in heaven. 
health. Ooh. God is all things positive. He tells us that when bad things happen, we aren't supposed to grumble. We're supposed to put on a happy face and not show that we are going through problems and saying, woe is me, this is happening to me, blah, blah, blah. Why does life always hurt me? Why is this not fair, blah, blah, blah. Because guess why? God uses bad things to address the bad things in your heart, to uproot them so you can see the need that where you need to change. So if God brings the bad things, you better respect the process because everything is from him. And when we grumble, we're basically disrespecting God. When we cling to the negativity of the past, we are essentially telling God that, nah, being positive, God, you're wrong. Your love is wrong. Ooh. So how do we apply God's love? Well, we learn to repent of our ways and how we do this is to also confess our sins to each other. And this is the exercise that I suggested calling out the theta wave imprinting is why do I do the things I do? Why do I think the way that I do? Why do I say the things I do? Why do I have that fear? Why do I refuse to go the distance? Why do I stop? Why do I start things, but I don't finish them? Why am I restless at night? I feel tired during the day, but then at night I can't shut my mind off. Why is that? Why do I have these bad eating habits? Why do I um, have conflict with that person? When you ask yourself these things, you're going to turn these questions inwardly and find the answers inwardly. And that's all confession of our sins is. To address the situation, so because what we do in secret, God knows about. So if we confess our sins to God and ask him, God, if there is any sins in me that I do not know about, expose them to me so that I can turn away from them. I say this to God all the time. And this is actually showing God that we love him. Because when we are willing to work on ourselves, we are showing God that we are willing to love him and willing to do things his way. And we are showing respect for him and the creation that he created us to be. Asking God draws out the negative imprinting that resides in our theta wave. And we can't change what we are not aware of. So confessing with our mouths calls to our attention that we are wrong. It's a way to keep us humble. That we are negative and we live in negativity. If we live in negativity, we also must feel it. And if we feel it, we must also be it. Because negativity is our original state of being. We don't have to be negative. It's a choice. By adhering to positive mindsets, we can achieve positive results in our lives. When we begin to shift our lives away from our negative upbringing and adhere to the ways of Jesus, we are adopting loving ways that eventually will become our character. Positive things positive character when we get rid of all things sinful we are rooted in negativity and we adopt a positive lifestyle we begin to feel positive we begin to feel positive things happen we begin to act positively do positive things think positively and this is when God's love becomes who we are when we apply God's love to our lives, there's a difference. When we not just feel God's love, we apply God's love to all that we do, all that we are, 
all that we say, all that we think. We are becoming a state of being. Love will be our state of being. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 through 12. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. Many of those who believe now came and openly confessed that they had what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In the same way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Acts chapter 8, 19 verses 18 through 19. We fight to hang on to what we are afraid to lose. Once you begin addressing your pain and healing from within, you begin to forgive and let go. When you begin to let go of the pains of the past and the pain you are causing yourself and others, you begin to realize what sin really is. And you begin to let that go too. With God's help, you will begin to see something remarkable happen within your spiritual life. You will begin to see your faith on a deeper level and you will begin to feel God's love with a sense of knowing that gives you a sense of purpose. The limiting beliefs that once hindered you are no longer an issue and you finally feel free to get on with your life. Your faith will lead you to feel like you are driven with a sense of purpose and a deep sense of calm, you will find that things just seem to fall into place as they just fall into your lap. This is what happened for me and I'm excited to share with you as I am experiencing a lifetime full of promise and miracles. I know that even in my quiet place where I sit and write this and I talk to you right now in real time about this, I know God's not done with me yet. But what he has done, I am so thankful to share with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Little did I know that in my marriage of 16 years would lead me on a journey of self-discovery like this. Whoa. I'm a slow learner, obviously. I thought I stumbled on a treasure trove of insight just in dealing with the five hidden brainwave functions alone. Oh, little did I realize that there was so much more about me and about life to learn. I began to see a pattern within scripture. This is one of positivity. Everywhere you look within God's book, you can see a running theme. People who follow God are healthy, happy, and old. <laughs> I've I want to grow old. I don't want to go through the aging process, mind you, but being old is a sign of wisdom. And life has a way of making you wise. Through God, I gained my health back as I, my body was degenerating before my eyes. I lived through horrific pain for 10 years that the doctors couldn't diagnose. And I turned to God and he told me what to do. And he healed me spiritually and delivered me of, of all things, demons. Wow. God has been really, really good to me. And I know he has been really, really, really good to you. Through God, we can find joy in life. Looking back on all we have achieved, of all we've come through, of all that God has achieved in us and all that God has done in us, we are still works in progress, but we can look back with no regret, no bitterness, no greed, no malice, but with forgiveness and love, and we can say, thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you for your help. And thank you for using others to help us. It is because of him we are these things. That we are going to grow old. That we are healthy. That we are wise. And that we are beings of love. And I do not need to tell you how we truly are nothing without him. Before I knew Jesus, I believed I was nothing. I had this reinforced to me through the family I was born into and the friends I met along the way. Because I believed I was nothing, I became nothing, but desperately tried to convince myself and the world I was something. Something has got to change, I thought to myself. And when I turned to God in defiant prayer, calling out to him that I was not responsible for the life I was living. How unfair. Well, he told me the truth. Jesus approached me in a dream. And I share with you that dream in other podcasts, so I won't share it now. But in that dream, he shared with me that I was responsible for the choices I made in my life. I didn't understand what he meant until years later and I guess years later still, I am finally discovering the depth of meaning in those words. Life doesn't just happen. Life happens for you, not to you. This is something that I have learned when God led me to understanding what the narcissist I was married to was meant for me. And that turns out was never meant to be a bad thing. Now that I find myself no longer feeling abandoned by the leaving of my husband or the rejection of him, I feel relieved and value the freedom within this newfound solitude and heavenly direction. I can focus on myself in a way that allows me to continue to look inwards at myself without recalling what was done to me. I don't, I don't reflect on the pains of the past and say, look at what I've been through. I deserve this. I deserve to be happy. I deserve God. No, I'm accepting of what was and I let it go and forgive as if it never was in the first place. I can accept myself as who I am as who I was and who I am to become, I am no longer allowing myself to reject me as this is what I have been fighting all along. And this is what you have been fighting all along. We have been fighting ourselves and in fighting ourselves, we too have fight, been fighting our Father in heaven. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life John 3:16 As the Father has loved me so I have loved you Now remain in my love John 15 verse 9 It's one thing to acknowledge these beautiful words of truth and it's another to actually believe them It took me a long time to believe them If we did believe these words, our Christian communities would not be so divided. And we ourselves would not be divided within our hearts. To believe comes from the Hebrew understanding to trust. One cannot trust without that trust being made proven because in this world, we are living in a world with no boundaries. That trust is automatically given when trust is earned. God wants us to trust him. Our love for him comes to him because he first loved us. But in getting rid of the fight within ourselves, our love and trust for God has to be proven true. And how that is proven? When things come to you. Let me share this with you. A month before my husband moved out, we had an altercation that had God not stepped in, it may have come 
become violent. At the time, God had shared proof with me about what my husband was doing behind my back. And I was collecting evidence, real evidence. I felt like I finally had the upper hand. But God told me to sit on the information, sit tight and do nothing. What? I couldn't believe it. Each day went by and I knew and I found new stuff. It was like my husband was like, I don't think he was doing it, but I felt he was being cocky and flaunting and lying in front of me and putting on airs and pretending. And I just like, I couldn't, I couldn't pretend and I didn't want him to pretend anymore. The more silent I became, the more in your face and arrogant driven I thought my husband was becoming, but he wasn't. That was my own pride taking over. But finally, I couldn't take it anymore, and I began dropping hints. I challenged his actions by dropping hints that he better play fair or the courts would side with me because the courts might find something out. Oh, that didn't go well. And I really want to share this with you because had this altercation not happened, I would not have realized something so important in realizing who I am and who God is. Now, my husband challenged me with rage, narcissistic rage. I keep throwing that word around because that's just the facts of it. We are going to see this word. If not already, you're just going to see it be brought up like um, everyday common speech. It's just the way the world is. And it's okay. But my husband actually challenged me with rage and countermoved my subtle attack. He was abrasive and not very subtle. And he fought back with all the hate and anger he had in him and resentment he had towards himself, towards me, towards the situation we had been living in. And he was actually like a shaken soda can ready to explode. Oh my gosh. When I saw the anger in his eyes and he was just, the more he was talking, the more he was getting ready. I immediately humbled myself and I grabbed his hand and I began talking in a soothing tone, in a tone of humbleness and weakness and meekness. And that calmed him down almost immediately. I couldn't believe it. But now in sharing the story with you, I realized I saw firsthand what it means to love our enemies. I dismantled the fight by not giving him one. Had I just remained silent in the first place, I would have been better off. But wait a minute. I am a believer that everything happens for a reason. And I believe God incited me to challenge him, to challenge my husband, because I believe that Had that moment did not happen, I would not have been able to see the truth for what it really was. With the altercation over and my body a bag of nerves, I laid down on my bed trying to compose myself and I was so humbled in that moment I could barely think. I was stripped of my arrogance. I was stripped of my pride. I couldn't cry. I wanted to. But all I said to God was, Okay, God, I'm done. I'm done fighting. I'm done fighting you. Instantly, God showed me what I had done to instigate and escalate the situation. In my right to feel validated, I stripped myself of godly living inside of me. I pushed God, who is love, aside 
out of my heart, and I stepped into me, the old me, the comfortable me, the one who wants to feel validated, the one who wants to feel loved, the one who doesn't want to feel abandoned, but has always been abandoned. I allowed me, my sinful nature, to take over and I stepped into the old reactionary ways of feeling the need to be validated and feeling the need to stand up for myself. God showed me that I was hurting me by standing up for myself at the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong advocate, me. There was a better way. God's way is the best way and his way dismantles the bully. Love does that. There is nothing wrong in staying humble. There is nothing wrong in acting in love by accepting the person for who they choose to be. We change because we can, but there are those who don't change because they can't. Sometimes our humility softens them so that they can consider their evil ways and change. But only when they are ready to. But oftentimes, staying humble is what keeps us safe. It keeps us from getting hurt. I shoved God aside and told him through my actions that I knew better. God showed me that because I was fighting against a man who did not value the tenderness of a woman, this man actually saw me as his equal in the way it gave him validation to meet me in his anger with equal footing. He approached me as if I were a man. That's the evil in his heart. It was resentful of who I was as a person spiritually and was no match for me in faith or intellect. So what does evil do? Evil does what evil knows how to do. Attack an individual by going for their weak spots, and mine naturally was being a woman. I am the weaker sex physically, and that is why most narcissists become aggressive and violent. That for them is the only point of attack that will be effective for them. Evil is not sympathetic. That is something we all have to understand. And I'm not calling my husband evil in the way of being evil incarnate or being devil-like. We all are evil. God tells us that the natural heart of us is evil. It's sin. So his sin was taking over and dictating to him just like my sin took over and was dictating to me. And see what, when you meet sin with sin, God says, do not not repay evil with evil. Because what happens, you get, that's where wars happen. But love covers all wrongs. What happens when you meet love with love? You get more love. You get overflow of love. When you meet evil with love, love covers evil and dismantles the evil, stops the evil in its tracks. When you meet evil with evil, you get war. Now, evil may appear to be sympathetic at times, but that sympathy is always self-serving. And I can admit that I acted in evil ways. I acted in self-serving ways, and the evil in my heart was telling me I was deserving. I had every right to seek justification for myself. He couldn't get away with hurting me as he had done. He broke up the family. He had to know what he was doing. Gosh darn it. That was my error and God used the enemy inside of me to once again stand against God so I could change by facing my enemy in the mirror and stop fighting against her. I was not fighting my husband in that moment. I was actually fighting myself. And in fighting myself, I was fighting God. And this is how our enemy overpowers us and wins. We are nothing without God on our side fighting for us. When we defeat the enemy within, the battle on the outside goes away and the soldiers dismantle and go home. When I realized that my marriage was a fraud... I was in shambles, and I took my husband's discretions as a direct attack on me. 
I allowed myself to feel abandoned by him each time he invalidated our marriage or his commitment to our family in some way. It didn't have to be women. It was other things such as spending and putting his needs first over the needs of the family. He neglected our family, neglected our house, and was willing to participate. Or excuse me, I was a willing participant because deep down inside, rejection for me was normal. My husband was just bringing out all these feelings to the surface. And over time, I just kept reacting and piling other things on top and burying my true self. Never did it occur to me that I was allowing this to happen because I had already rejected myself. There were problems before we married, but I couldn't see it. I couldn't see that my actions that led to us marrying one another played right into the way I thought about myself. I rejected me. So why shouldn't people reject me? Why shouldn't my husband reject me? His rejection of me continuously validated what I had already felt about myself. That I was worth rejecting. And I pursued that. Had anyone told me at that time, I would have denied it. I never thought I was rejecting myself. I thought I loved myself. I always liked me, sure. I I made mistakes, but those mistakes I never took and said, oh, I made this huge mistake. I'm so dumb and stupid. I liked me. I never consciously thought I was invalid, and that's the point. The conscious decision to pursue my husband when we were dating was opposite of what the decision my theta wave had already made for me. In pursuing my husband, somebody who was all wrong for me but turned out to be all right for me, somebody who was drawing out the pain and hurt in me, I was pursuing that. That was my choice. I had been my own worst enemy for a long time. And I couldn't see it. That was only until God, as my best friend, stepped in and shared with me the truth. Jesus tells us to love our enemies. The scripture is one that drove me into twisted knots inside. It's been three years where I finally discovered, you know, what is love? How do you apply love? I've never been loved, so how do I, I love? I remember 10 years ago telling God, I don't know the love of a father, so how can I love you? How can I trust you? Ooh. God likes it when we're bold with him. I mean, I was being honest. And every day for those 10 years till this moment, God has always showed me he loves me by bringing negative things into my life to challenge me, to get me to work through it, and to be there to nurture me through it. Even when I didn't see those things, those challenges as what they were, and I made the wrong decisions, God was still loving me there through it. That's a best friend. That's our father. That's our father. He doesn't judge us. And my choices that I was making was causing me to be an enemy of God and God still loved me still showed me. Yes, the narcissist was my enemy, but not the enemy I was ultimately battling. The narcissist in my life was meant to challenge me, to expose the enemy within. I realize in this moment 
that I'm sharing with you. How I've been an enemy to myself and because I have been an enemy to myself, I was an enemy to God. Uh, let me explain this. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4-8, through 8, I encourage you to memorize this and apply this to yourself, to others, to God. Really reflect this when you are praying to God. Really reflect this to yourself when you are feeling low. Really reflect this to somebody else who is in conflict with you. Love by the world standards is a state of feeling. This is seen by the goodness and joy we bring to others and the pleasure that others emotionally bring to us. And this is why we are friends with people because, oh, they just seem like good people. And by this definition, not all love expressed is the same. It's not equal. But this is not so with heavenly love. The character of God is love. He cannot change because love is who God is. Therefore, we can say that love is defined by God's character as his state of being. The state of being is who we are to emulate. We are to live in love by adopting his character. This cannot come to us by any other means except by following the word of Jesus in obedience. When you stand God's character up to the fruit of the Spirit, you will see that love gets rid of the sin in our hearts. Love is a way to repent of our sin and uproot it. When we begin to value the works of Jesus and adopt them as our own, this is when we, we begin to show that we love him. When this love manifests as our character, it is then when we can show or share who we are with others. God's character, which is love, is everything that hate is not. To live in hate is what it means to be an enemy of love. Now, God is constant. He is consistent. His love cannot change. He cannot be one state of love to one person and then another state of love to the next. That's why he has no favorites. Who God is, is a universal expression of love given to everyone, regardless if the individual hates or loves. Therefore, we are to love our enemies because we are to adopt the character of Jesus. He is love, and we are to become love. This is why shift happens. This is why bad things happen for us so that we can become love. There is no other way that this can happen. All my life, I have felt like life just kicked me to the curb. All my life, I felt like I was a failure. And all my life, as hard as I tried, I felt like I was never good enough to produce lasting positive results. Oh, I had positive things happen. But why didn't people stay? Why didn't that positive love that gave me a sense of purpose stay? Why did everyone leave? And why did positive events leave? Because I kept leaving myself. I kept abandoning myself because I did not know how to love myself. And if we cannot love ourselves, we cannot love others. And if we cannot love others, we cannot know the love of God because we cannot accept it and we can't love God himself. The battle for me wasn't narcissism. I'm going to go on a limb and say that the battle for you isn't narcissism. Although this is what we must deal with and conquer in our lives. The true battle is overcoming the battle within because narcissism has us look at the enemy we have made ourselves out to be. We are our own worst enemy and when we stop fighting the narcissist, we begin to heal from narcissism. We become an advocate of love to ourselves. We become loving towards ourselves and that is the art of war. The enemy of your enemy is your friend, but not until you realize who your true friends are. 
A narcissist is someone who has a role to play in your life. And to end the battle against them, you must find a way to respect the role that God has them live. You must respect the process and begin to accept that they are who they need to be for you. When you begin to stop fighting them, you begin to stop fighting yourself. When you begin to heal of the conflict within, you begin to view God's love as a new per- from a new perspective. Being love isn't such a bad thing. Becoming love allows you to stop fighting God and his ultimate will. Becoming love allows you to finally call God home in our hearts and we finally feel welcomed, validated, whole, as love gives us our sense of purpose back. Love calls us back to who we truly are. We are one with God as we are from God. When we love our enemies and allows us to accept them for who they are, we are tolerant to who they feel they need to be and respect that their decisions are best for them. As God gave us free will, we should respect and allow other people the, the respect to have free will for themselves. Scripture tells us we are not to judge those outside of the jurisdiction of Christ, but judge those inside of it. Only when we ourselves have a working knowledge of righteousness and have overcome the sin in ourselves, then we can help lead others out of it or judge against it. To judge anyone who is not of God, an enemy, simply means that we are judging ourselves as we once were enemies of God. If we are unloving to ourselves, we are still a fair-weather friend to God and not fully and completely at the point of living as a state of being quite yet. Oh, I should say that we are not fully and completely at the point of living as a state of a loving being quite yet. We have work to do and that's okay. We are all works in progress. And so we need to be cautious with our judgments because disrespecting those God can use to help us gain a closer walk with him, it is to disrespect God himself. To love our enemies allows us to fully grasp and fully love ourselves because it is when we love our enemies, then they are destroyed. Resist the enemy and he will flee. James chapter 4 verse 7, I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Matthew chapter 5 verse 39, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 2, do not become over, excuse me, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans chapter 12 verse 20. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Philippians chapter 3, 18. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Luke chapter 6, verse 27 through 28. Enemies disguise themselves with their lips, but in their hearts they harbor deceit. Though their speech is charming, do not believe them, for seven abominations fill their hearts. Their malice may be concealed by deception, but their wickedness will be exposed in the assembly. Proverbs chapter 26 verses 24 through 25. Jesus is the example we are to live by. At the whipping post, Jesus took the enemy's terror on himself so that we would not have to. He did this because only he could. Jesus is a being of love as love is who he is. Love is his state of being. Jesus gave his life so that we might retain ours. In doing so, Jesus remained silent. He did not ask why he was being beaten. He did not stand in defiance. He did not call upon angels to help him. He did not even use the power of the Holy Spirit to comfort him. Jesus stood in love for his enemies and accepted them as they are. Evil cannot be anything other than what it was designed to be. 
the opposite of love. Jesus did not chastise evil for being evil. He remained who he has always been, love. In remaining love, Jesus not only defeated the enemy, but destroyed his enemies. Because it is when we can accept our enemies and love them as they are, they become defeated and destroyed. There is a reason why Jesus says, resist the devil and he will flee. It is because when we begin to see our enemy as how we once were, enemies of Christ, then we can sympathize with our enemies and offer them the same compassion Jesus gave to us, to them. Our enemies may bring the fight to us, but we don't retaliate and we don't bring the fight to them. When we resist their combative ways, when we resist their tyranny in the way of not giving away our emotional power, we remain in control of our beings. We remain in control of who we are, beings of love. Love is a state of being, and this is something our enemies are not. They are a being of hate. When we allow our enemies to exercise their free will choice, as it is our free will choice to choose to stay in love, as love is who we are, what happens? There's no fight. The fight becomes stagnant as our enemy has no ammunition to co combat against. Love holds no record of wrongs and therefore the enemy does not need to defend itself. Love is patient and kind. It does not boast. It is not self-seeking. It is not rude. And all the enemy can do is turn to offense. If the enemy continues to fight, as in the case of the Romans, who continued to beat Jesus, even though Jesus gave them nothing to retaliate with, more mercy was poured out because when the enemy is not fighting you, but continues to use you to prolong the fight, they really are now fighting with themselves, and the fight is in truth a battle from within. Just as you are meant to be love as your state of being, the enemy is also a state of being. Hate is who they are. This battle within leads to self-destructive behavior. As seen with the suicide of Judas. How many people turn inwardly and cater to their self-indulgences to appease their guilt? I do not doubt that the Roman guards who whipped Jesus and stripped him of his dignity were numb to empathy and had self-destructive tendencies. Killing an innocent person only made their inner torment worse. They were an enemy to God, to his son, and to themselves. Just as we once were before we knew what love truly was and is. When we realize that we are our own worst enemy, the battle stops. The inward turmoil ceases and we begin to just accept the trauma that has happened to us and we accept that our decisions from that trauma was a necessary evil. When we are faced with ourselves in the mirror as the reflection of ourselves, as our enemy stares back at us, we who are beings of love can reflect that onto who we once were and the pains of the past begin to fade. Who we once were begins to disappear and a rebirthing begins. It isn't that we negate the past. We can't. If our past did not happen, we would not be here. But without Jesus and his love, we would not have or we would not be where we are now, living for today and living in hope for a better future with him. When we stop fighting our enemies of our past, those people of our past who brought negative experiences to us, we begin to stop fighting ourselves. And when we stop fighting ourselves, we stop fighting our enemies that belong in the here and now. When we stop fighting these people, we stop fighting the enemies of our future. And we stop fighting God. We become a people's advocate for love because we are love, as no longer are we enemies to, unto ourselves. When we love others, we can love Jesus and we can help others for Jesus. When we love others as we love ourselves, we are as beings of love that always considers not the here and now, but the here that prepares us for our future in heaven. 
when we approach everyone in a way that reflects who we truly are as a reborn creature in Christ, we become the peacemakers. We bring the hope of heaven to others through the foundation of Jesus that we ourselves live as being love outside the world's construct of love. When we become love, we live the mandate of heaven that love is a state of being, firstly. And we reflect our state of being through a state of feeling. Love covers all wrongs and love begins to break down barriers. And where barriers are broken, miracles begin to happen. You are a living miracle. I have witnessed miracles and I don't chase them. And I don't advocate chasing them. But I am accepting to them when they happen, knowing that they will happen. Miracles are never meant to replace our obedience to God through Jesus. Many people assume that if they are witnesses to miracles or things supernatural that are seemingly beneficial, then that must mean that the favor of God is with them. This isn't always so. When miracles become self-serving and signs and wonders bring attention to an individual, these things witnessed have no meaning because they have no love. Love is a state of being, is about giving. Giving comes from the compassion, mercy, and sincerity. To not want your brethren to suffer because you yourself know what knows what it's like to go without. In your suffering, you know what it's like to be afraid, abandoned, hated, tossed aside, and rejected. Love does not reject. It cannot. It can only exist from a place of giving. Where there is giving, there is love because to give means to accept. To accept means to share. To share means to value. To value means to show an equality that is limitless. You are limitless because you belong to the creator who has no limits. When you work through the challenges that enable you to become who you were meant to be, a being of love, a state of being of love, you begin to realize who you are and who you always were and why things happen to you for the re way that they did. God loves you and love also respects the choices we make because love can't always do for us what we should do for ourselves. Love allows us to grow and where there is growth there is inner strength and where there is inner strength there is inner peace. An analogy of this is seen in a toddler learning how to ride a bike. As parents, we are loving enough to put training wheels on the bike as we know they cannot yet balance themselves as they are not yet strong enough to do so, both physically or mentally. God's love is like this, where he allows us to walk in love with training wheels, but in our growth, those training wheels must come off. What that means is, as parents, we know that our children are going to fall. And we can only help guide them and steer them. As much as we would like to ride the bike for our child, they can't learn without experiencing for themselves how to overcome balancing the bike in an upright position. To do this, they must fall. It would be unloving as a parent to prevent our children from this experience, as experiencing the bad helps our children to do their best to remain upright to prevent a fall. This is why bad things happen to God's children. Because God does not delight in our failures, but knows that in our failures, the outcome will be success in Him, through Him, as all glory goes back to Him. You are a miracle. You are a being of love, created in love, created for love, by love. You were created to be loved and to express love. You are an expression of God's love, and His love makes you whole, complete. His love allows you to accept who you are and what you were, and allows you to the courage to step into your being of who you are to become more love, and to express that fully and completely so you can give love away and share that with others. To manifest love in the form of miracles is to share with others God's love and in fullness without limits. There is nothing you can't do when you understand who you are because you are accepting of who you are. 
God brings to you challenges not to hurt you or hinder you, but to challenge you to grow your love that is within you. It starts as a spark, and when nurtured, begins to grow abundantly, like the mustard seed of faith as love begins to define you as you become defined by it. When you shift past the pains of your past and allow yourself to accept the hurt, you begin to walk in forgiveness. This is where you begin to truly understand who you are as Now your birthing process can begin as you become a new creation through understanding first and then practical application. Once you understand you are reborn and a new creature in Christ, you will be challenged. You will experience situations that will try to draw up in you the old self-defining ways that you once used for self-expression. Resist the temptation and stand tall in who Jesus is. You can do all things in Christ Jesus who is your strength as love empowers you to become powerful against anything that the enemies of this world try to tempt you with because you are love and not an expression of the feeling of love. All temptation is gone and the enemy will have no choice but to flee and you are free to live the life you were called into for his purpose and plan. There's nothing stopping you. To stand tall and live in courage, to be the light to others and give them courage and strength in their trials, temptations, and in their rejection of themselves. Hmm. What a beautiful thought. What a beautiful miracle you are. Spread this message, but not before adhering it to yourself and working with God to have him help you work out your own challenges. You are welcome to contact me for sister support, encouragement, and guidance. S-R-N-I-T-Y-B-L-U at gmail.com. Look on www.dynamicwoman.ca for videos and uh, articles and also to see if life coaching is something that you and I would be able to work together on. What we reap, we sow, and what we sow, we reap. And what we sow has benefit to others and to us, as there is nothing selfish about harvesting love for ourselves. We need to be replenished. We need to be encouraged, and we need to know that we are a part of something greater than ourselves. To love and to be loved is the defining moments in our lives, as this is the meaning to life. If you felt encouraged by this message, and if you would like one-on-one consultation, consider contacting me to see if personal coaching is right for you. If you feel encouraged to donate and help support me by keeping this information free on the internet, please offer a donation. Only I request that you just give that prayer full attention first. With my heartfelt thanks at the following address, find me at paypal.com and use my email address, srnityblu at gmail.com. And first and foremost, I would like you, if you found value in this commentary, share it and go to dynamicwoman.ca and find this um, podcast in PDF format and download it and share it and spread the message of God's love and share his message of love by becoming a being of love. Love is a state of being and you are love and love is what you were meant to always be. Be blessed. My name is Shannon Gilmore. Thank you.